Isaac, chapter 9. The people who walk in darkness will see great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Candle of Hope, would you please stand with us as we sing our first Christmas carol. <laughs> Come thou long expected Jesus born to send thy people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in thee Israel's strength and consolation Good morning. How are y'all? Oh, thanks. Good to be with you. Wow. Okay, this is a time to be honest. I'm not just talking to the kids here. I mean, everybody in the room, how many people like to sleep with a nightlight? How many people sleep with nightlights? Colby, get that hand up. I know you like it. By the way, this is my first time on a regular service to have my grandkids in the audience, so this is super fun for me to be here today. I'm a nightlight guy. I need to, I get up several times in the middle of the night. Uh, guys, you know what I mean. So I, I, I need a nightlight or something bad might happen. But this, the Christmas season is really about darkness and light. Great job reading the passage out of Isaiah 9 for us. Thank you, guys. Um, and you can hear it in that passage that there's a great light that's come into the darkness. This past Thanksgiving, Dana and I were invited over to some friends' home. 
for dessert in the evening time. And they live in a rural setting out in the country. There are no street lights. There are no lights. And it is so dark. You're supposed to ask me, how dark was it? It is so dark. It's darker than a bat's mouth. That's how dark it is, okay? It's dark. So if just to show how dark it was, I stopped the car and turned the light off. Turn all the lights off. I couldn't see the dash. It's that dark. And Dana and I were driving up this little country road with no lights thinking, I don't think we want to live here. But when we pulled into their driveway and the doors swung open and the lights poured out, and the friends greeted us in the warmth of their family and the good pecan pie that we had. It was just an opportunity to really see this light and darkness juxtaposition. And we love this. We love this whenever we see it. Any Johnny Cash fans in the room? All right. Wow. That's more than I expected. Um, you know that uh, most of you that are Johnny Cash fans will know that almost every concert that he began, he would say what? Hello, I'm Jonah Cash. And then they would do that little down, 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 right? And he would sing Folsom Prison Blues. Well, actually, Johnny Cash got all of that start from this concert right here in 1968. He went to, he was kind of known as an outlaw, spent some time in jail, not prison. That's, that's a little bit of a stretch. But he did spend some time in jail. And in jail, while he was at this, uh, at this prison in Folsom, he met a guy named Glenn Shirley. And Glenn Shirley had written a song called Greystone Chapel. And it kind of talks about the difference between light and darkness. This guy who's a prisoner writes this song. And this is, these were the words of the song. Inside the walls of prison my body may be, but my Lord has set my soul free. Now there's a gray stone chapel here at Folsom, stands a hundred years old, made of granite rock. Takes a ring of keys to move around here at Folsom, but the door of the house of God is never locked. And Johnny Cash and his band learned this song the night before so that he could do it in that concert that you just saw. And it became a part of what he would do, that he kind of became known. And then from then on, he would always sing the Folsom City Blues song or Folsom Prison song just talking about this great, and his life began to really ex show us what it's like to see light and darkness. Andrew Peterson said it this way, sometimes the pinprick of light, the sun coming up at the end of a long night, is made more beautiful by the darkness that surrounds it. And the Bible, in this contrast, is actually full of it. John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John 12, I have come into the world as light so that no one who believes me should stay in darkness. Ephesians 5, 8, even talking about us, you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. And so we're going to take the Advent season to kind of walk through these, this really, this contrast between the darkness and the light and see how the birth of Christ um, does this for us in a beautiful, beautiful ways. So let me pray for us. We're going to take a look at Matthew chapter 1. To do this, we're going to be in the book of Matthew for the next four weeks. And, um, and then actually after the new year, we're going to stay in Matthew for a while. But let me pray for us. God, thank you that you left the light of heaven and ventured down into the darkness that your name is Emmanuel, and that means that God is with us, and that is what we celebrate with this Advent season. Now, God, would you take a passage of Scripture that we wouldn't normally spend a whole lot of time on, and then would you, would you break open your hope? As this is the Advent week of hope, would you break open the hope you have? Expose the darkness. Pour in the light, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 1 begins this way. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, big confession. There's genealogies throughout the scriptures. When I'm doing my reading, I skip them. I mean, it's just the son of, the son of, the son of. And, but there's some things in here. When Matthew starts out, there's very big purposes about why he would start 
a story about Jesus. You would think he'd get right to the birth and right to some other things, but he begins right here with a genealogy. And he does it in a very specific way. So I want to talk about four questions around this genealogy. Why start with a genealogy? Why would a Jewish first century um, scholar, a disciple of Christ, try to start this way? Why, why do a genealogy? Why, what's up with the son of David? That's a strange name. What's up with 14? He says that this 14 is a big number. This is what he closes out his genealogy. He says, thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and then 14 from the exile to the Messiah. What's up with 14? And then why these people? Why did he include the people that he did? Because here's the truth. He didn't include them all. It's actually, it's been perplexing to Bible scholars for a long time why he's done what he's done. Not that I can finally solve the great mystery, but I think some people have, and I want to share uh, with you what that is. Now, first, then why a genealogy? Genealogies are more than just uh, tracing a family tree. Um, They would affect not only your economic status, um, but also your social status and your religious status. In order to partake in some of the festivals that were going on in the Hebrew tradition, you had to be able to show that you were, in fact, Jewish, that you were Hebrew, and that your genealogy was there. It also, the land that was passed down from family to family, it always stayed inside of that family. Your welfare that way would be. So your genealogy is not just, well, this is cool. There's a website that says I'm linked with so-and-so. That's more, it's so much more than that. It has to do with all of the day-to-day kind of things. In other words, the genealogies, Jewish genealogies, would be more than just a family tree. They'd be like the entire forest, the way that you interact with everybody that you know. And it gives you a bird's eye view of where you've come from. Matthew's genealogy is meant to show how God has been adorning the darkness of a sinful, broken world. He's going to just bring some certain concepts in on this, and you'll see it as we kind of go through it. Now, why son of David? Well, he made a crazy claim at the very first verse of his genealogy in chapter 1, where he said, Jesus the Messiah, the son of David. Ten times in the book he's going to call Jesus the Messiah, the son of David. Now, this is a very uh, subversive claim. He's got to get behind this somehow and give some, give some proof to it. Otherwise, they're not going to buy it. The, claiming to be the Messiah was like a pretty regular thing. It, was a pretty, it, it happened on a regular basis. And so he's trying to give some credence to whether Jesus is really that guy or not. So he begins by doing this. And he'll refer to like Isaiah 9, which the passage that was read, and other things. And so I'm not going to go through and read all of this, but he's going to begin with Abraham, and he's going to work to David, then he's going to work to Jesus. And as he does this, there's kind of two things that he does to kind of emphasize it. Now, here's the, here's the, we don't understand this. If you have to emphasize something in Hebrew and Greek, you're kind of limited because you don't have bold, Right? If we want to, if we want to make a text get somebody's attention, what do we do? Bold or more likely, all caps, all caps, and then exclamation marks, uh, marks, and then probably some kind of an emoji that, you know, listen, listen. You don't have any of those options here. So there's really kind of a couple of different ways that you can do this. And one of them is to do some kind of a pattern. The other one is to do some kind of repetition. That's the way that you're going to kind of emphasize things. Son of David is the emphasis. Son of David is, is, is Matthew's emphasis. He's giving Jesus a title that everyone who reads it would either say right away, wow, he, I, I know he is the Messiah because I saw what he did because this book was written after the life of Christ. Or he would have said, blasphemy. But either way, what did Matthew do? He got their attention. So that's why the son of David kind of comes along that way. It's also um, now, it's it's also got this built into it, this crazy thing of 14. And this has been, this has kind of messed with scholars for a long time because he actually leaves out generations to get to 14. (laughs) 
<laughs> big self-disclosure there. He leaves out some of the, the, the generations to make sure that it adds up right. And people couldn't figure out, why does he say it's 14 when you know it's not really 14? Why did he make it 14? What's the deal? Well, he's changing some things to emphasize what? Son of David. Okay, so here's the deal. Uh, Gematria is a process of, of Hebrew that assigns numeric value to letters, words, and phrases. Okay, you, you don't need to know that except for this. David, this is really three Hebrew letters. Guess what the total of those three letters are? You can do it. There's the, that's it. 14. 14. And so he has taken David. Remember, he's trying to emphasize over and over again that Jesus is the Messiah. Without bold, without emojis, without exclamation marks. And so he actually puts the genealogy together in such a way where he claims it at the first and then organizes the, the genealogy in such a way that it puts all of the emphasis towards son of David, son of David, son of David. Now, in the midst of this, he also changes some of the names. He takes some of the kings out and he puts like a prophet in and a poet in so that he can cover really all of the different things that are going on throughout the Hebrew Scriptures. Everything that points forward to the Messiah. He's saying not only just the, the law of Moses, but all of the poetry of the Hebrew Scriptures and all of the prophets are pointing towards this guy, Jesus Christ. This is Matthew's way of letting us know that Jesus has come to fulfill the hope of the Psalms and the promise of the prophets. It's Matthew's way of putting Jesus' royal family lineage together to show that he really is um, the king of kings. Now, here's my favorite part. Why these people? Why are these people in here? Because there's, there's some folks in there that you really wouldn't expect. If you're trying to highlight the credibility of Jesus and his lineage, then you'd think you'd leave out really evil kings. And you wouldn't mention women. Now, don't, don't be offended. You know, a long time ago, 3,000 years ago, when David was born, his lineage was established, and they wouldn't use in the genealogies, they just wouldn't use women. They would just trace it through the patriarchal line. But Matthew very intentionally includes some gals in here. Uh, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Now, if you, were, if you wanted to just uniquely honor women and put them in this genealogy, then you would think he would use like the matriarchs of, of the Jewish nation, like Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel. But instead, he, he uses different gals, very specific women, women that are not commonly mentioned, but these are not commonly mentioned because of some of their past, some of their reputations, some of the, their professions. They were not Israelites, some of their heritage. They were not connected to Israel's family. They were associated with some indecent scandal. Not necessarily by fault of their own, but they came from a past of sin and brokenness. And in here, Matthew's intent on including these women because he wants to make sure that you see that in this lineage of the son of David, everybody's included. A couple more things about these gals. It shows that the flourishing of God's people, all the way from the flourishing of God's people to the exile of God's people, God was at work. Because now what you're seeing is, is that when he specifically lays this line out, he says that God has obviously been planning something. This kid wasn't just born and then God said, oh, here, let's get it started here. This has been going on for generations and generations and generations and generations. Literally thousands of years. So it goes from the flourishing of God's people to their exile, which people would have wondered, what the heck's going on? Remember, when Matthew writes, this is the first book of the, Old, of the New Testament, God has been silent in the nation of Israel for 400 years. 
God and Matthew is trying to say, don't worry, in, even in all that time, God was still working. God has been at work through kings and prostitutes and sinners. And good kings and wonderful people. Light and darkness. The inclusion of Tamar and Rahab and Ruth and Bathsheba as well is unusual. The four men- of the four mentioned, Rahab and Ruth are foreigners, and three of them, Tamar, Rahab, and Bathsheba, were stained by sin. Of these four, two were Canaanites. Ruth was a Moabite, and Bathsheba was probably Hittite. And they exemplify this amazing grace that's extended to people who've made mistakes who come from different lineage, all of those kinds of things. You see what Matthew is doing? He's establishing this wonderful light and darkness theme that says even in the midst of things going poorly, where it seemed like God was completely out of control, even in the midst when it seemed like God was quiet and didn't have anything to say about what was going on, his plan was unfolding very specifically. And it's on top of that, not only was he very specific about how he was getting it done, his inclusion of all of these different groups and different people communicates not only is God very specific about what he's doing and his plans will not be thwarted, but he's also very gracious. And he will include all kinds of people if they are open to that. Matthew highlights that in the darkness, Jesus is really there to show us what kind of God we serve. And then the true story of Jesus becomes our story. The failures, the ups, the downs, the successes and failures, the seasons of flourishing and seasons that feel like exile. No matter what your story is right now, no matter how you're doing or what you've done where you've been, who you are. God is adorning the darkness all around you and you can't, sometimes can't even see it. Micah 7, 8 says, Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Psalm 18, My God turns my darkness into light. And then John 8, 12 says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. See, Matthew isn't just listing names out. He's communicating some things about Jesus and about the God we serve and how that kingdom unfolds around us. Sure, it's a little bit veiled. Sure, we need a commentary to try to figure this thing out sometimes. But that's the way God, God sometimes is bigger than you and smarter than you. There are all kinds of groups that are among us, but I want to talk to four different groups. So those of you who need nightlights, don't freak out when it gets a little darker. The first group of people I'd like to talk to are those who are really young in the room. There might be some kind of an expectation placed on you that you're, you really can't accomplish much until you get older. You just need to sit and do your thing and, and be quiet. And sometime you'll grow up and you can then really live. You can really make a difference. You can do the things that God called you to. Little boys and girls in the room, I want to tell you that God has created you just the way you are. And he's placed inside of you gifts and talents and interests and personality. He did that on purpose. And he created you for purpose. And I would tell you, no matter what big people say all around you, you don't have to wait another minute to be part of God's unfolding plan in the world. In fact, you're our brightest hope. You're our best solution. 
You don't need to get older to figure out this. God loves you. He knows your name. And he wants to walk with you every day of your life. And I hope you'll tell Jesus that you love him too. And that you want to follow him. And you place faith in his work on the cross for you. This church needs you. Our world needs you. The second group is a group that really uniquely battles darkness differently than all the other groups. Because it is the air you breathe. It's those that are in their late teens and maybe early 20s. Still trying to figure out maybe what they want to do with their life or maybe they've really already figured it out and they're just waiting for some time where they can get older. That group that Bobby leads. That group of young folks that leave and come home for Thanksgiving. I would tell you that you probably have the most energy in our room and uniquely gifted in such a way that when that energy and that giftedness comes together, you can get more done than those of us that are older can ever think about. And you can do it with freshness. You can do it with a, with a, a newness to it. Stop waiting for, to get old enough to try to change things and change them now. Do what it looks like. Live out what it looks like to follow after Christ with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength and do it now. Do it today. Embrace the reality of Christ and then walk in the darkness in ways that we can only marvel at. I know there's a ton of distractions at this age. I know there's all kinds of things you're still trying to figure out. We get it. We act like we don't, but we were just as confused. But don't be confused about this. Jesus Christ came, and he decided to come through a teenager. The most important mission He's ever given a human. <laughs> Think about that. She was probably 13. Embrace the reality of Christ in your life. Stop half-stepping. There's a third group over here in the darkness, and your darkness is really the pace of life. You've had kids. You've entered into a career You've gotten married, maybe. I guess I should have said those in different order. <laughs> but anyway, what it, what it looks like for you is that there is just a pace to life that you've just got to keep up with. And the faith thing, although important, it certainly is important, it doesn't get your best effort. It doesn't get your best thoughts. It doesn't get your best energy. And we understand it's because, man, you got little ones. And they're, if, if there's an energy war in your house, you lose every time. And so you've got to kind of pace yourself. And figure out how to make this work without going crazy. And yet, without the strength of your faith... You will make decisions that will possibly establish patterns for you that will ruin the rest of your life. It'll ruin it. I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm telling you, it'll ruin it. And it'll, the consequences of the decisions you can make at this lamp right here have such long-term effects that I would, I would ask you, please, Please, if you're a follower of Christ, if, if somewhere along this line you have come to the decision to follow Christ, then follow him. Realize that, that the weirdness of the genealogy is really your life. He, he see, God seems quiet. And yet he's specifically working. 
You see, you don't have the benefit of being over there on those two lamps. That's where God shows up and, and nudges along. But right here, he's figured out that, you know, you've come to grow a little bit. And just like you would if you were raising an older student in your house, you would start doing less for them because that's what's natural. You don't celebrate a 15-year-old going to the bathroom <laughs> like you did when he was four because why? Because he's not four and it's just flat out sick, right? Some of you have walked with Christ so long and yet you're still waiting for Christ to celebrate that you got up and went to the bathroom. <laughs> Grow up. Grow up. Be strong. Be the man and woman that you want to be and that God created you to be. There's another group over here. It's the one that I'm in. And those of you in the room that are in the later stages of your life, can I make a plea? Would you please stay engaged? I know there's more energy over there. I know. So let them do what energy requires. And you be the sage. You be the wise person. You be the person who's been down that road and warns them of the curves ahead. They're going flat out. This group over here is good. I just said go flat out. And that's what they'll do. They'll go flat out. That's what, we, that's what they should do. Now, will you warn them when there are some curves in ways that are still honoring for tomorrow? Here's the deal. There's a group that doesn't get a lamp. <laughs> And that's the group that likes yesterday more than they like tomorrow. If that's you, you don't get a lamp. You're res you resign. You retire. You're out. But if you like tomorrow more than you like yesterday, if you believe that the candle we just lit really is the candle of hope, then the church can't be what it needs to be unless all four groups stay engaged. All four. That's the beauty of the church. That's the beauty of following Christ. That even when it seems like he's silent, he's still active. Even when it seems like it's out of control, he's numbering the generations until he moves. The candle of hope tells us that all things are possible in Christ. That the, our biggest issues have been dealt with on the cross. Sin is no longer a problem. Yes, we're going to still sin, but it's already paid for. God's not up there worrying about what you're going to do tomorrow or this afternoon. It's done. It's paid for. He wants to know, will you step in faith and follow him? Will you walk out and follow him? him and adorn the darkness of our county and our world. All right, that's about all the little ones can handle and the old ones. <laughs> so let me pray. God, we rejoice at the fact that you are still at work. You are still accomplishing, even though it seems a little out of control. You are still at work, and we can trust that. And we can also rejoice that all are invited in. Every age, every ethnicity, every person, within the sound of my voice, you are pleading with to engage in a faith walk relationship with you through Jesus. 
God, even when we don't see it, you're working. Even when we don't feel it, you're working. So as we say the words of this song, may it be a declaration of our heart, our intent to move forward in faith. Because Jesus has made that possible at Calvary's cross. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.